All right, welcome back. So far we have seen the derivative used to find the slope of functions. However, the derivative can also be used to find the rate of change for one variable with respect to another variable. And a common use for rates of change is to describe motion of an object that is moving in a straight line, whether that be up and down or left to right. And when we describe these motions, we typically view the up direction to be positive and the down direction to be negative. In the same way, we view the right direction to be positive and the left direction to be negative. And so one way to think about this is if you were on a building, let's say if you were looking at the up and down direction and you were at the top of a building and you dropped, let's say a rock and it fell down, it would be losing height. That rock would not be as high up from the ground as it would be as it started. So as it falls down, it is having a smaller and smaller height. And so that would be why we would call the down direction negative. Now for left and right, it's not as clear why we choose the right side to be positive. However, do notice that if we were to move these two lines together, that the signs would match up with the coordinate plane, where the right side are the positive numbers and the left side is the negative numbers. And of course, the signs of our up and down directions would match the y axis as well. So kind of think about it like that. But just know that the right side is the positive direction and we typically see that as an object moving forward and the left direction we typically view as an object moving backwards. An example of this could be a car driving in a straight line or a ball rolling in a straight line, things like that where there is no change in height. And when we describe that motion of objects moving, we typically are describing their change in position. And when we are describing position, that also means that we can view the speed at which something is moving or the velocity. And so what that means is that the velocity is a rate telling us how fast the position is changing. And so that's where the idea of a rate of change comes from in terms of application. And so when we are describing an object's position, we will use a function to describe it. And most of the time you're going to see a function such as s of t, where t is time. Now, typically that's going to be seconds, but it could be another unit of time such as minutes if it was specified as such. And so if we are interested in describing the change of position over time, we could look at that as the change in position over the change in time. And this would be the same as writing delta s because s is our position function divided by the change in t or the change in time. So this would be the same right here. And this is very similar to our slope formula, right? We have a change in our y values divided by our change in our x values. That is typically our slope. So this is very similar to our idea of slope, just in a more applied scenario. In fact, this would be known as our average velocity. So just like I said, this is similar to slope and the slope will give us the average rate of change between two points on a graph. This is going to give us the average rate of change or the average velocity between two points in time for a moving object. So what do I mean by that? Let's take a look at an example. All right, so here's our example. We have a position function here, s of t is equal to negative 10 times t squared plus 50. And let's just say that this is describing the position of a ball that is dropped from the top of a building that started at a height of 50 feet. We wanna know what is its average velocity on the interval of time from time equals one to time equals two. And so how do we find the average velocity? Well, we already defined earlier that average velocity is equal to delta s or the change in position divided by delta t or the change in time. And so we can use our position function and our given time period in order to solve this. So we can say that this is equal to plugging in the endpoints of our time interval into the position function to find the position at each of those times and subtract to find the change in that position and divide that by the difference of our time interval endpoints. And so we'd start with our latest time value of of two and plug that into our position function and then plug in and subtract our earliest time of one. And then this would be divided by the difference in our time. And so then let's go about solving this. This is going to be equal to negative 10 times two squared plus 50 minus negative 10 times one squared plus 50. And so where did that come from? Well, we we're plugging in our values of time into our position function. So we took our value of two and we plugged it into this t right here to get this part 
of our calculation. And then we plugged in one into this function to find this part of our calculation. So then we just have two minus one. So this is all over one. And then we can simplify to have negative 10 times four plus 50 minus, and then we're going to have a negative 10 times one. So I'm not gonna bother to write that and then plus 50. And so then if we were to simplify this, we would have negative 40 plus 50, which would be 10. And I'm gonna write this over here. We have 10 minus negative 10 plus 50. So we're gonna have minus 40, minus 40. And that is going to be equal to negative 30. And so what is that negative 30? Well, that is our average velocity over this interval of time from t equals one to t equals two. And so we would say that our average velocity is negative 30 feet per second. All right, now I didn't tell you originally that this position function was in feet, but typically when a problem is written, they will tell you what the position is measured in. I forgot to tell you that, but that is how we would write our average velocity. It is a rate of the change in that position over the change in time. So you have to remember to have those units as well. And so this would be the average velocity between these two points of time. But what if we wanted to know the exact velocity at a single point in time? This would be known as the instantaneous velocity. Well, this is where the derivative comes in. So just like with the tangent line problem, where instead of knowing the slope between two points with a secant line, we want to know the slope at one point using a tangent line. In the same way, now we're interested in not necessarily knowing the average velocity between two points, but knowing the exact velocity or the instantaneous velocity at one point in time. And so let's take a look at how we would find that next. So just like I was explaining earlier, when we found the derivative for a function using the tangent line problem, we came up with this limit definition of a derivative. And so we can come up with a similar definition for the velocity function or the instantaneous velocity at a particular point in time. And so because of this, we could say that the velocity function with respect to t or time would be equal to the limit as delta t or the change in time approaches zero for our position function of t plus delta t or the change in time minus the position function. And this would all be divided by delta t. And so we have the same formula here that we can use not only for slope, but also for velocity. It's just an application of this same definition. And so this is equal to the derivative of the position function but we actually just call this the velocity of the function. This is going to give us the instantaneous velocity or the velocity at a single point in time for this position function. So now let's look at an example where we actually take the derivative because that's really what we are interested in at the end of the day here. So here we have that the position of a car in feet is given by this position function, 15 t squared plus eight t. And we wanna know the velocity at time equals three. This is another way of saying what's the instantaneous velocity at time equals three. If it is asking you for the velocity at a single point in time and not an interval, you know you're looking at instantaneous velocity, which means you're going to be using a derivative. So let's start by finding our velocity function. And our velocity function is going to be equal to the derivative of the position function. And so that is going to be equal to taking the derivative of this function that we are given. So let's take that derivative. We know our power rule can be used here to multiply two by this 15 and then we'll subtract one from our exponent. So we're gonna have 15 times two times t, two minus one. And then we're gonna be adding that to the derivative of eight t. We'd have eight times one times t to the one minus one power, which is going to be t to the zero power, which is just one. So we'd just be left with this eight. So let's simplify. We're going to have that this is equal to 30 times t, and then we're going to add this to eight. And so this right here would be our velocity function, but we're not done because we didn't just want to find the velocity function, we also wanna find the instantaneous velocity at a specific time, time equals three. So now what we're going to do is we're going to plug in this value of three into our velocity function. So what we'll find is that the velocity at time equals three is equal to 30 times three plus eight, and that will be equal to 90 plus eight, which is equal to 98. And remember that this is a velocity, so we need some units, and that's going to be our position unit, feet, over our time unit, which would be seconds. So this would be feet per second. 
And just note that unless it is specified otherwise, time is usually assumed to be in seconds. So even though I didn't say it here, it's in seconds. And so that would be our instantaneous velocity at time equals three. It's actually a pretty simple process. We take a derivative of our position function and then we plug in the value of time that we are interested in because the derivative of a position function is going to give you the velocity function. All right, so let's look at one more example here. This one's a little more involved. So here we have that a pebble is dropped from a bridge to a river below. And we are given a position function here. And from our diagram, where we have a little dude up here on the bridge throwing a pebble, or I guess he's dropping the pebble, he's not throwing it. He's dropping it from here, and it's going to go down to the water. And we're told here that it is a height of 96 feet. And then we're also going to assume that the time is in the units of seconds. So then the problem asks us two things. We want to know, firstly, when does it hit the water? So that's asking us for a value of time. And then it wants to know what is the velocity at the time of impact. So how fast is that pebble moving at the moment it hits the water? That's what we want to know. So let's start with the first question. So we'll do that first. So if we want to know when it hits the water, we want to know when our position is zero, right? Because our pebble is starting at a height of 96 feet. We want to know when it hits the water, which would be the height of zero feet. So what we're going to do is we're going to set our position function equal to zero and solve for t. And that's going to give us a time value for when that pebble hit the water, or more specifically, when its position is zero. So let's do that. We're going to have zero is equal to negative 16 t squared minus 16 t plus 96. Now this seems a little complicated, but we can actually pull out a common factor here of negative 16. I see I have a negative 16 here, a negative 16 here, and I'm pretty sure 16 is a factor of 96. So let's start by pulling out that negative 16. So we're gonna have zero equal to negative 16 times t squared plus t, and then we're going to be left with minus six because six times 16 is 96 and we're pulling out a negative 16, so we have to make sure that we have a negative six left over. So then we have a term that we can factor. So let's do a little bit of factoring. We're gonna have zero equal to negative 16, and I believe that in this case, we're going to have t minus two and t plus three. So hopefully you are familiar with factoring by this point. So then we can solve for our values of t. We know that we're gonna have zero equal to t minus two and zero equal to t plus three. And that is going to give us two values of t where we're gonna have t equal to two and that's coming from here if we add two to both sides. And then we're going to get t equals negative three from this one. So we're going to have these two values of t. Now, what do we know about time? Well, time has to be greater than or equal to zero. We can't have negative time. We're starting this problem in the present time, so we can't go backwards. We are assuming that in this problem, we cannot time travel, right? So we are not going to be interested in this negative time value. So now we know that the time when it hits the water is going to be time equals two. Okay, so that's going to be the answer to our first problem. So we know that it hits the water when time equals two. That is our first answer. All right, so let's work on our second part of the problem, and it asks what is the velocity at the time of the impact? So we already know that it hits the water at time equals two, so now we just have to find the instantaneous velocity at that exact point in time. So now we have to take a derivative of our position function to find that velocity function so that then we can plug in our time that we already found. So we know that the velocity function is equal to the derivative of the position function, and that is going to be equal to the derivative of this function right here. So we're going to have negative 16 times our exponent two times t to two minus one, right? That is our power rule. And then we are going to have negative 16, right? If we have a constant and a variable of degree one, we're just gonna be left with that constant. And then the derivative of a constant like 96 is just going to be zero. So we're gonna have plus zero. Didn't really need to write that, but I did anyway. And so then if we simplify this, we're gonna have negative 32 t minus 16. And that would be our velocity function. So now we wanna know what is that velocity at time equals two, or the time of impact. We already found the time of impact, so now we just have to plug it in to this velocity function that we just found. And so if we have the velocity at time equals two, this is going to be equal to negative 32 times two minus 16. And this will be equal to negative 64 minus 16, which is going to be equal to negative 80. And then remember, this is a velocity, so we're gonna have to have some units, which in this case would be of feet per second. 
And that is the answer to our second part of the question. So really finding the instantaneous velocity at a particular point in time using the derivative really isn't too difficult. So that's all I had for this lesson. Hopefully this made sense. If you do have some questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. But if you wanna look at some more examples for this topic, I'll have an examples video linked in the description as well as at the end of this video that you can click on. But until then, I will see you next time.